so we uh, started euclid's gcd so you are given uh, two integers a and b in bits and you would want to compute the largest c that divides both so if the largest c is 1 then we call the numbers to be co prime otherwise we say that they share a factor right so like 100 and 1000 uh, share a factor but 100 and 1001 they don't so they are co prime that's the definition of co prime uh, so euclid gives an algorithm gave an algorithm to compute gcd which we call uh, euclid's gcd algorithm and uh, this is based on uh, long division so it will basically reduce the e comma b this computation will reduce this computation to some smaller instance of the same problem right so it's basically a recursive algorithm which is how you must have implemented it in esc 101 so uh, you assume that a is greater than b and uh, you can also assume that both of them are positive and so this is greater than 0 and then you uh, compute the remainder of a mod b so that <coughs> remainder is r so you instead of working with a now you will work with r okay so in this case now you can either say that the remainder is between 0 to b minus 1 that is one way uh, but we will prefer this we will prefer that the remainder be b by 2 or less so then the issue with this is that what to do with b by 2 to b minus 1 range so that range has to be reflected in with neg negative sign right so you subtract b so that is the left end minus b by 2 uh so now we can uh, truthfully say that the instance before has been halved right so previously the instance smallest number was b in the new instance the smallest is b by 2 or less right so in this sense uh, there is a halving that has happened so that's the key idea that you have the instance and so you can see that uh, this process when continued will very quickly converge to the gcd right how quick how fast how many steps are there log b right because the smallest one is being halved so doesn't matter what a was only depends on b and then log b many steps it will be reduced um it will be reduced to basically zero you will get zero and uh, then what a one number comma zero will be the gcd that's the last step base case yes yeah so i'm being in inconsistent that is true uh so let's remove that assumption some students will not like inconsistency okay so the algorithm is just use this repeatedly to compute the gcd so it will stop so now since b can also be negative uh, let's remove the sign and then take log so it stops in log b many steps so you can think of the unsigned value of a to be more than the unsigned value of b so b is still uh, smaller in a way and that many steps you will require so let's do the formal analysis because that i think uh, very few would have seen uh, so this algorithm what exactly is the time complexity exactly i mean in terms of asymptotics 
so number of uh, bits of a bits of b what is the time complexity analysis if you do this lazily then you will get a bad bound so we have to do this a bit more carefully so let us see this as uh, two by two matrix transformations okay so you started with a vector a comma b and you are reducing it to b comma r vector so there is a uh, matrix transformation happening so what is that matrix transformation so first step is is the matrix 0 1 1 minus q1 times a b so a times 0 plus b gives you b and a minus b q1 so q1 is the previous uh, in the previous slide the quotient that you got you are not now calling it q1 so a minus q1 b will be the remainder so now let's call it r1 okay so here this is the equation a minus q1 b or a you divide by b and then get the quotient and the remainder and uh, in the previous step you had a b so we can call b uh, r0 and we can call a r minus 1 so that will be consistent with the next steps so we started with r minus 1 comma r0 and then we get to r0 comma r1 okay that's we move to the next step so the next step is now so the matrix will be uh, of a similar type in the next step also okay so it will be 0 1 and 1 minus q2 so times uh, br1 because we have ensured that uh, in the first step uh, b is somewhat smaller than a and then in the next step r1 is somewhat smaller than b so it's similar kind of transformation will give you r1 r2 okay so here the equation is uh, well the first row gives you r1 that's clear the second row is the long division so b is equal to let me write it in the same way so minus q2 r1 is equal to r2 okay so you divide b by r1 and that will give you the quotient q2 and the remainder r2 remainder r2 again you will assume is uh, uh, around half of r1 in magnitude right so so the algorithm thus proceeds so it will have uh, log b many steps so let's note that so do this for log b rounds Uh, so this lg will always denote uh, log to base 2 right this in this case is the number of bits in b maybe you need to take a ceiling here so do it for these many rounds and uh, then what happens so then you will get to let's say r i and r i plus 1 where r i plus 1 has become 0 right so at some point it has to go below 1 but below 1 the only integer possible is, is 0 in this case so at that point then the gcd will become uh, trivial to calculate because you are looking at some integer ri and the integer 0 so that's the base case right so let's write that down so the base case will be or the halt condition 
So base case of the recursion or in this iterative implementation is the halt condition. So this is uh, when R i is equal to 0. Okay, so this is uh, you have these many transformations. on uh, AB. So now you can see that the every step is just multiplying by a 2 by 2 matrix of this uh, kind of uh, triangular form. It is not, not exactly triangular, but triangular with respect to the anti -di 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 diagonal. Uh, so you can compound it and multiply by all these 2 by 2 matrices in one shot uh, to the vector AB. And that gives you 0 here. And what is the second element? So, this is the GCD, right? So, you have computed the GCD of AB in the after i steps. So, what is the overall time complexity? So remember time is uh, counted in terms of bit operations, right? This we had said before, that is the definition of time. So you have to do the analysis and then in the end give a function of log A and log B. So let us do it step by step. So for the jth step, what do you get? So one j is equal to 1 to i. Uh, or maybe i minus 1. So, what is the jth step complexity? What should I put here? Uh, log of qj and log of right. So, uh, no, no, that was not the so this is just the complexity of long division. So, in the jth step, what is the complexity of long division that we saw in the last class? The divisor and the, the quotient. Yes. So, yeah, I think you were right. So, let me write down the invariant first. So, the invariant is uh, r j minus 2 is equal to q j plus r j. This is the invariant. Okay, so, you divide uh, r j minus 2 by r j minus 1 getting the next remainder r j. And remember that r minus 1 is A and r 0 is B. So, these are the equations you have. Right? Is this correct? So, j equal to 1 will give you A equal to q1 times p plus r1 and so on, right. So, sanity check is, is fine. So, looking at this, so what is the complexity of uh, computing here qj and rj? That is the question. That So, that complexity you have to put inside the bracket, right. So, this complexity is last time we saw it is log qj times log rj minus 1. Yeah, so this is the sum we are interested in. Is this any questions here? So I am being very careful here because uh, if you are not careful, so one lazy analysis that you can do is just put here log a times log b, right? Or just put here log a square, log a whole square. But then the sum will give you another factor of log b. So you will actually get uh, essentially a cubic time complexity. But if you do my way, then you will get quadratic complexity, which is the real complexity of this algorithm. So it is not cubic time, it is quadratic time. So how do you get that from this sum? 
how do you simplify this? So this is less than equal to, uh, we cannot analyze this sum of product, so we have to remove something from this product outside and upper bound it, right? So we can remove from here, uh, maybe this log of Rj minus 1 we remove. So Rj minus 1 is at most? At most B, exactly. For J equal to 1, it's just B. So, so that is what we can bring out. And now we get some space to do further simplification. So this is now uh, only sum of, so let's bring the big O outside, that's allowed. Right, so now you only have to analyze sigma log qj. So what is that? Again, if you are not careful, then this will become quadratic, this thing in, inside big O, because the sum has already log b many terms. So you will get log b times log a. You don't want that. You want to do this carefully. Any ideas? Look at the invariant equation. Invariant equation tells you that qj, so qj times rj minus 1 is equal to rj minus 2 essentially. So when you take log, log qj is kind of the difference between log rj minus 2 and log rj minus 1, right? So you can replace this by the difference. So Rj minus 2 minus Rj minus 1. Is that fine? In this equation, Rj is very small. So you can say that log Qj is at most, uh, it, asymptotically it is just a difference of these two logs. And now what? Yeah, then you can do the telescoping sum so you can see that everything will cancel out except uh, one thing, which is log A. So you get log B times log A. Is that fine? Right, so this analysis tells you that uh, Euclid's GCD algorithm is actually quadratic time. And if you do this lazily, then it, it will give you cubic time. So what we have shown, so that is your first theorem in this course. And it's a very old theorem that uh, integer GCD is computable. in log A times log B time. So that is one thing you learn, but this algorithm actually gives you more, right? So that also you must have seen that it actually gives you a combination of AB that is equal to GCD, right? Which is called extended uh, Euclid GCD algorithm. So how does that work? So I want to claim here that moreover, the algorithm yields u1, u2 that are natural numbers such that u1 a plus u2 b is equal to the GCD. One of them has to be negative. Okay, probably I can put a minus sign here then, but let it be symmetric. So magnitude of u1 is smaller than b and the magnitude of u2 is smaller than a. Okay, 
So this algorithm actually gives you this combination, uh, linear combination of AB, if you like, uh, where both the coefficients are under control. So u1 is smaller than b and u2 is smaller than a. So the opposites, kind of, such that the linear combination is exactly GCD. Right? This is something which uh, could not have been predicted by the definition of GCD. So this is a rather uh, special and surprising property. So what this tells you uh, in the terms of ideal, so if you look at the ideal of A and B, what is it? Ideal over integers. Yeah, so it tells you that this ideal which is uh, A priori generated by two generators actually has a single generator which is the GCD. Right, which is uh, quite unexpected. Uh, so this starts the theory of uh, principal ideal domains and so on, or unique factorization domains, which you have must have studied in algebra courses. So this is saying that uh, uh, if you take an ideal of numbers, then it is generated by only one number. And that one number is the GCD of those numbers. Uh, so why do you get that? Because obviously both A and B are in the RHS, right? Because GCD divides both A and B, so they are by definition of ideal in RHS. Now why is the RHS contained in LHS? That is the identity above, right? So by this identity, yeah, yeah, don't rush. Let's first understand this. So that first equation is telling you that A comma B can be expressed as a combination of AB, but that combination is actually a Z combination and hence RHS is in LHS. So LHS is equal to RHS, right? This is what you have gotten. Uh, but what is the proof of the theorem, this especially the second part? So what is the proof of two? Do you see that the uh, previous uh, slide gives that? Multiply all the matrices to get one to way to make. Yes, right. So you just focus on this equation. So you look at this equation one, and uh, uh, what will you get if you multiply these two by two matrices? So you will get a single two by two matrix, and uh, let's say it has elements alpha, beta, gamma, delta. So then alpha, beta with AB inner product is equal to GCD. That, that's the simplest uh, proof. It immediately follows. So in equation one, multiply the matrices. And uh, the second part of, second part, that u1, u2 are small, how do you get that? Why are they small? So that is actually uh, very simple, I think you see this in discrete math or some courses. So suppose u1 is not small, suppose it is b or more, then you divided by B, get the remainder. And you rearrange this equation. So you can write, uh, so say u1 is greater than or equal to B uh, in magnitude, but we can also assume u1 is actually greater than or equal to B. Then, uh, then what you can do is you remain, compute the remainder. Uh, Q B plus U one U one prime, let's say, where U one prime is uh, small. So now the equation will be Q B plus U one prime A plus U two B is equal to the GCD.
so uh, u1 prime a is what you want to be there right qba is the garbage so what do you do with this qba well you absorb it in the subsequent term so you will get u1 prime a plus u2 plus qa uh, b is equal to gcd now does it help so this is now so now u1 prime is under control it's below b but what can you say about this uh, second coefficient u2 plus qa what do you think so the the idea is simple this u1 prime a how big is this product in magnitude it is at most ab i mean it is smaller than ab in fact uh the gcd is uh, much much smaller than ab so that we can even ignore so this equation is saying that uh, something which is smaller than ab plus the underlying coefficient times b they are roughly they, they, they are basically uh, equal roughly equal so u1 prime a and uh, this u2 plus qa we can call it actually u2 prime so let's call it u2 prime so u1 prime a and u2 prime b they are roughly equal in magnitude that is what this equation is saying which means that u2 prime is at most it is at most a right if u1 prime a is at most ab and these two are roughly equal then u2 prime cannot exceed a okay so you deduce that this is smaller than e so that's your final equation that is what you will output you will output u1 prime and u2 prime is that clear so in fact the the way algorithm is written this step might be needed so u1 may blow up but then you reduce it and when when you reduce it then the corresponding u2 prime is also reduced so both are reduced simultaneously okay that's a, that's an another amazing property of this uh identity so this identity is also called uh, is it called bizu identity yeah so that's uh, that this identity has a name so that's the bizu identity uh, any questions okay so now this algorithm is uh, extremely important uh, we'll see the importance again and again in this course but for now let us just write these corollaries so given co prime integers ab we can compute a inverse mod b in the same time how do you do that how can you invert numbers so first of all why should a inverse exist <laughs> right but why should it so in fact even the reason why a inverse will exist uh, goes through euclid's uh, gcd right so euclid's gcd algorithm uh, tells you that a inverse mod b exists and not not only it exists it can be found efficiently okay so 1 over a can be found mod b uh, why is that or how is that yeah so you have this u1 a plus u2 b equal to gcd of ab which is 1 so now you look at this equation mod b 
and u1 is your answer. So u1 is uh, A inverse. Right, so that's all. So that is the significance of u1, u2. For co prime numbers, uh, u1 is essentially the inverse of A and u2 is the inverse of B. Right, so inverse computation is uh, made simple now. And uh, similarly, you can compute LCM. So how do you compute LCM using GCD algorithm? Yes, so this is uh, LCM is equal to or LCM times GCD is equal to is equal to the product. Right, so you find one, you find the other. So use this property. So first prove this property and then uh, this will give you the algorithm for LCM also. So LCM is the number that is divisible by both A and B. It's the thing opposite to GCD in a way. It's the least common multiple. So that also you can compute while the definition of LCM seem to need factorization of AB, right? But uh, this fast algorithm is completely factorization free. And that has to be the case, otherwise uh, you'll be stuck with factorization. There is no known algorithm for factorization. Okay, so now uh, once you have set up this machinery, you can now apply it in uh, very different rings. Okay, so this computation you did in the integer ring, but you can do the same as was pointed out before. Uh, you can do this for polynomial ring as well. But then the complexity metric will change. So we'll, we'll see how it changes. So arithmetic complexity in polynomial rings. also get solved similarly. But now one has to properly measure the complexity or one measures complexity differently. So that we'll see now. So in a polynomial with integer coefficients, uh, how will it be presented in the input? it will be presented coefficient by coefficient, which are all in bits. Uh, and how many will they be? How many coefficients will there be? This is around the degree, d plus one. If degree is d, then d plus one many coefficients. So uh, this d will also enter in the complexity. So it's not only the bits uh, that a coefficient needs, but it's also d's. It's kind of, uh, bits, uh, so log of a coefficient times d, right? That is the new input uh, complexity and also the output complexity is similar. So you have to now uh, state the complexity in those terms. So let us see that. Yep. So polynomial arithmetic in Rx. So R is a ring with where you know how to do the ring operations, addition, multiplication. In fact, for this discussion, we'll consider it to be unit time. So we'll not worry about the ring operations in R. Uh, we'll only worry about once given these subroutines to 
add and multiply in R, what can you do with the polynomials? How much is the complexity of the polynomials? You can think of R as Z. So, F plus minus G, uh, F and G both are in Rx. So, this sum or difference can be computed in how much time? So, not time, sorry. Uh, we cannot say time here, we will just say uh, how many ring R operations will it take to compute the sum. So, this will only take degree of f plus degree of g many r op r additions in fact, not even multiplication. So, instead of time now we are moving uh, to a bit more uh, abstract measure, we are not worried about uh, how much time r additions will take that somebody else will solve. But once it is solved, how much will the uh, f plus g computation take? So, that is bounded by the degree. Now, what can you say about multiplication? how many R operations? Yes, so this will be multiplicative, right? Because if you look at the definition of uh, polynomial multiplication, there is this convolution that happens. So to compute the coefficient of x to the i, you have to see in how many ways can x to the i be formed. So, there is you pick x to the j from f and you pick x to the i minus j from g and then do this for all j, right. So, actually to find even the coefficient of x to the i, you have to do a linear scan and then there are uh, degree of f plus degree of g many coefficients. So, it becomes quadratic. So, this is degree of f times degree of g. Is this clear? So, this is just uh, formalization of uh, the high school algorithms that you know, right. For polynomial arithmetic, these are the algorithms you already know, but this is the time complexity. So, now let us make it more complicated and talk about uh, <laughs> division. So, f equal to q times g plus r. So, you have to find the quotient and the r uh, which are now polynomials in x such that degree of r is so degree of r has to be less than uh, the divisor degree which is g right. So, this can be computed. in how many ring operations? So, what is this? So, you have to go back to Euclid's GCD algorithm and whenever you are doing the division step, you have to now do polynomial division, right. And uh, so, well, what is the complexity? Actually, th this is not uh, GCD yet. So, we are only talking about one step which is division. So, so look at long division. Uh, so, how many R operations would be needed there? Yeah, why is that? So, you will have G and F and then here you will be computing the coefficients basically one by one, right. So, the first monomial that you will compute this one 
this monomial will be the leading monomial of f divided by the leading monomial of uh, g right so that's the leading monomial and the coefficient will be similar the quotient the ratio of the coefficients corresponding coefficients and so on so you basically compute one monomial then you multiply it by g then you subtract that from f and repeat right this is the long division process uh so how many steps would it have so how many square boxes are there the so degree of f minus degree of g right uh or in fact in in terms of this degree of q so degree of q many steps are there and in each step how much price are you paying degree of g so that is the neat complexity uh it is uh, now completely analogous to what you got for numbers so there you got log of uh, q here you have degree of q right so so generally this would be the dictionary for numbers uh, log the bit size and for polynomials the degree that is how this conversion happens for the division when we divide the coefficient of the leading monomial of f by leading of g yeah yeah that is true uh, but one can say that either this algorithm will give you the output or it will get stuck because it tried to divide by zero so the program may give division by zero error we don't care so at any point if it finds a zero divisor zero divisor means i cannot i can get in degree of g sorry i can get in degree of g for example if we have uh, no 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 in one step what are you doing you are dividing the coefficient of f with coefficient of g so as long as that division is defined the algorithm will continue and it's actually an important point uh, so if the coefficient of g was 1 so which means that g was monic then doesn't matter what the ring is right so maybe that one can remember so so that's an important point so if g is monic so yeah the question really is uh, why should q and r or why should r exist so if g is monic then r always exists for all rings r okay so this is a very useful uh, fact that uh, generally you don't have to worry about uh, r being a field it can be any ring because usually in applications we'll make sure that g is monic so if g is monic then it doesn't matter a division by zero will never happen if g was not monic then there may be a silly coefficient sitting which uh, may behave like zero in that ring and so when you ask the computer to divide 1 by 0 it will complain and the program will crash so that is fine if it doesn't crash then it will take these many steps degree of q times degree of g in fact this also is a nice mathematical fact that r exists if uh, g is monic uh, irrespective of what ring r is it's it doesn't depend on field properties okay uh so now with uh, armed with long division you can talk about gcd right gcd is now also within reach so similarly uh gcd of fg <coughs> so why gcd of fg uh in the same time degree of f times degree of g right so there is a important difference in the proof so in the euclid gcd proof that you saw for integers we were saying that the instance the number is being halved now is something being halved here so here actually nothing is being halved here actually just the degree is being reduced by 1 because the division step tells you that uh, 
degree of r is less than degree of g it is not half so it will actually take uh, degree of g many steps and then when you couple the proof with this fact the previous proof with this fact and you sum sum, sum it up uh, you will still get degree of f times degree of g okay so you can do that as an ex exercise is the same proof but there is a key uh, halving step missing yes halving is removing one bit yeah exactly so uh, the, we were doing halving there because the measure was log of uh, the number so when you have the number then log changes by minus 1 uh, here degree will change by mi minus 1 so in that sense it's analogous it didn't even not exist because r is not monic so in the means r is not monic so in the next step, the next step we cannot have the like, same algorithm mm -hmm. if r is not monic yeah yeah but if it doesn't exist the program crashes don't worry yes i should add here that if it exists so similarly gcd and f inverse if they exist for r f and g so you may find examples of the ring and two polynomials when uh, gcd doesn't exist okay if r is a field then it will al always exist if r is not a field then some step may get into division by zero but not for every fg so for for ring r that is not a field there might be good instances of fg so whatever is given to you in the input the algorithm will accordingly decide okay the algorithm will not prejudge the input any question was thinking maybe gcd exists but Possibly could not find the model. We need to add it to that. We need to add it for this thing. So this is this. Maybe the GCDs officially. So it's really like. Uh. You may be theoretically right. Uh, but if it exists, maybe this will find it. Try to prove that. That I don't think we can. Yeah. Try to prove that if it exists, then this will find it. intermediate division yeah so to be safe so what is the safe setting maybe i should also write that so the safe setting here is uh, r is a field and then doesn't matter what f and g is if r is a ring so non field then safe is g is monic uh well not for gcd so then we don't know what safe is so it's just just erase this no no of when you get to the remainder after few steps it it's out of control so let's remove this so for field this makes sense for other rings uh, it may crash sorry it's only safe in i is a field yeah right so next uh, thing will be it's to do with factorization of rings so if you have a ring uh, or say to put it simply if you have a number n which is a product of two primes like 2 times 3 right so the arithmetic modulo 6 is it re related to arithmetic mod 2 or mod 3 right so is there a connection between the arithmetic of uh, ring and a sub ring kind of so number and a factor what is the connection so we'll formalize that so so that thing will be true quite generally but we'll first give it for uh, integers so it's useful to factor rings when doing ring arithmetic so 
because then the arithmetic can be reduced to simpler rings, rings which cannot be factor, which uh, don't have factors, in decomposable rings. So if you haven't seen this product of rings, then let us define that. So for rings R1, R2, uh, with completely different operations possibly, addition multiplication is completely different in these rings, the sets are completely different. Uh, there are these, uh, there are many ring constructions that you can do. Using a ring and especially using two rings, you can construct new rings. So one such construction that, that is relevant here is R1 cross R2. So what is this ring? So as a set, this ring is just pairs R1 from R1 and small R1, R2 from big R2. What are the addition and multiplication operations? Component Yeah, so the multiplication and addition is coordinate wise, right? So in this pair, R1 is in a different uh, word and R2 is in a different word. So if you want to add R1, R2 with R1 prime, R2 prime, then you can just add R1 and R1 prime and R2 with R2 prime and get the new pair. And the same thing you can do with multiplication. And you can convince yourself that this is a ring again. Plus and multiplication is same in both. No, no, no. Completely different R1, R2. No relationship. R1, R2 are independent. I'm saying that there will be two plus and two. No. When I say that R1 cross R2 is a ring, I have to define the operations for the set elements. The set element is a pair. This is a new kind of operation, right? Plus and this is a third operation, yeah. R1 had one, R2 had second, and this product has third. So this is also called, I think, uh, direct product of two rings or external product. Yeah. But we'll simply call it a product of rings. Factor uh, of R1 cross R2 we'll call R1 or R2. Okay, so we, we see this as something uh, that we saw in integers. That's our notion of factorization of rings or product of rings. Uh, so this is coordinate wise. Okay, so, so now the question is, uh, if we have a ring R whose factors we know are R1, R2, so R is essentially, or R is uh, isomorphic to R1 cross R2, then doing ring arithmetic over R, how is it related to ring arithmetic over R1 and over R2? Right? That's the fundamental question. So the most basic result here is, what is the result called? Structure Sorry? Structure uh, yeah, that's fancier. Chinese Something more basic. Yeah, so Chinese remainder theorem. And remember, we are interested uh, mainly in algorithms. So whatever we say about structure theorem, we have to show that uh, it's efficient. It should be very constructive. So the most basic result is Chinese remainder theorem. So we'll be using this uh, all the time in various forms uh, in this course. We'll call it just CRT. Okay, this is an old uh, result, possibly in different form. around 1500 years old. Uh, we will just see the proof in terms of integers and then you can generalize it uh, accordingly. So the theorem for integers is so 
So, A, B are co prime integers. Then, uh, how do you see integers mod A, B? So, this ring uh, given by this mod A, B arithmetic, how is it related to mod A versus mod B? Yeah, so that is what we claim that this is actually isomorphic to doing things in parallel. So, one of you does computation mod A and your friend does computation in mod B and um, then you combine these two results to get the answer mod AB. So, that is the existential thing, but uh, it is actually very constructive. So, moreover, the isomorphism is computable. in uh, log A times log B time. Okay, so, that is the interesting uh, part for us that this isomorphism the ring uh, mod A B is actually strongly related to mod A and mod B and uh, this connection can be used uh, in quadratic time. Uh, so, for example, z mod 6 is uh, factors as z mod 2 cross z mod 3. Uh, why did we use co prime? Is there any reason? Why this extra assumption? So, let us see an example. So, z mod 4 and z mod 2, 2 times. So, is there a relationship between z mod 4 and the RHS? Why are they not isomorphic? Interesting. Yeah, so cyclic group with respect to what? Two operations are there, right? It's an element of order, respect to order four in LHS, but none in. Yeah, yeah, but with respect to what operation are you talking? Addition. Addition, right? So if you just look at the additive structure on both sides, you will see a difference. Okay, you don't even need to go to multiplication. So if you look at the element one. So, you know that uh, unity or the identity element in the LHS is 1, the identity element in the RHS is 1 comma 1. So, if it was isomorph, they were isomorphic then these have to be the same. But if you make them same then the problem is uh, the 1 comma 1 if you add it to itself you get 0. But on the LHS, you do not get 0, you get 2, which is not 0, right? So, that is the contradiction. Uh, so, that is the witness, in fact. This is the witness for non isomorphism. So, co primality is necessary. Uh, without co primality, it is always false. Okay, there is no uh, saving grace. Okay, so, we have to use co primality in the proof. Right? How will you use it? In, yeah, inverse and uh, Euclid GCD. So, GCD will give you the inverse. It will exist when the numbers are co prime. That is what will be used in the proof. So, let us. Uh, So, to f give a isomorphism first you have to give what? A homomorphism. 
right? First you design a homomorphism, and then you lazily claim that it's an isomorphism, right? So what is this uh, first step? What is the homomorphism? So suppose you have u comma v element on in the LHS ring. So what should you associate u comma v with in the RHS ring? It's easier to give a map. Uh, it's easier to give, uh, yeah, that will be sure. But what I want to do, you will have to do anyways. You cannot escape it. So, but you can take a hint from RHS to LHS. So basically, you want a number in the RHS which mod A takes you to x1 and mod B takes you to x2. So what is that magic number in the RHS? So basically you want a number in the RHS which mod A takes you to x1 and mod B takes you to x2. So what is that magic number? Okay, so the map will be this x1 u1 plus x2 u2 uh, such that mod A it should become x1. So what we'll do is uh, we'll take u1 to be uh, b inverse mod A. That is true. And we'll take u2 to be A inverse mod B. And of course, we can compute u1, u2 efficiently. In quadratic time, you compute u1, u2. And then look at the linear combination of x1, x2 like this. Right? So when you take remainder mod A, you will see that uh, you will get x1. Because u1, b becomes 1. And when you go mod b, you will see that you get x2. Because u2 and a are inverses. Right? So these are very, these are independent uh, moduli. So mod A and mod B have nothing to do with each other, right? But this single number is able to satisfy both the constraints. So it's a clever uh, construction. And uh, so that's your map phi. Now, why is this map a homomorphism? So well, first property we have observed is phi x1, x2 is x1 mod A and it is x2 mod B. And uh, the other properties are, first is that phi is a ring homomorphism. Why is that? Why is it a homomorphism? So you have to see what, how does it behave on addition. And it is clear that, I mean, since the image is a is linear in both x1 and x2, it will behave well with addition, right? Now, what about multiplication? So x1, x2 times x1 prime, x2 prime. What will happen there? So maybe that you see. So what is this? And this is you are doing mod AB. This multiplication you do mod AB. Uh, so what will this give you? The cross terms will get cancelled out because they will have AB term and the one square will be also one. Exactly. So the fortunately the cross terms uh, are zero in this ring. So this is only multiplying x1 with x1 prime. 
Okay, let me write that u 1 b square So, first we get this, what is u 1 b square? That we have to understand, mod a b. Do you see that it is u 1 b? So, show that this is actually u 1 b. And this is u 2 a. Okay, so, the square actually has no effect. Uh, so, you, so, this expression is actually equal to x 1 x 1 prime or uh, one coefficient and the other coefficient is x 2 x 2 prime. So, which then is actually the image of phi x 1 x 1 prime comma x 2 x 2 prime. Right, that is the magic. So, this is why multiplication uh, is also preserved because the phi of this x 1 x 1 prime x 2 x 2 prime is actually phi of product. So, phi of product is equal to product of phi. So, this is why phi is a homomorphism. Second property I want to emphasize is phi is injective. Why injective? If it was not injective, then something must be mapped to 0, right? So, 0 means that uh, this x1 u1b plus x2 u2a will become uh, multiple of ab, it will be 0 mod ab. So, what will that give you? You can actually deduce from that that x1 and x2 both have to be 0. So, the only pre image of 0 is 0. So, phi is injective. Is that enough for isomorphism? But do you need to prove that? Or can we end the class? Exactly. So, since the both are finite rings, we do not need to go there. It is automatically surjective. Okay. So, which means that this is actually an isomorphism. Right, so, that is the that is the full proof. Any questions? These basic uh, ring ca calculations you should fill in, it will be good for your education. Okay. But overall this is how you prove these things and every step here is efficient. So, from the RHS you can go to LHS and from the LHS you can go to RHS. Okay, both sides, uh, so phi and phi inverse both are efficiently computable maps. Right, so this is completely constructive uh, using Euclid CCD. Okay, stop.